Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for attending. Welcome to this session on, on Russia piling up the bones, as they call it, which is a very sort of aggressive way of looking at it, but that's fine. Uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Tom Clark. Uh, I'm the chairman of a company called Global Public Affairs. We're based in Canada and Washington in the United, in the United States. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I must say, we also have somebody who attended the University of Toronto. Uh, so uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I just want to very briefly uh, introduce you to the people who are here, tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Brian Whitmore is uh, to my left. He's a senior fellow uh, and director of the Russian program at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, and in a much previous life, he tells me, he worked for the Boston Globe in both Moscow and Prague. So he's got a deep understanding of the situation. Uh, Sophie Katsarava is the head of the Georgian delegation to the OSCE. Uh, she spent 11 years at the British Embassy in Tbilisi and for her work in terms of helping relationships between Georgia and the United Kingdom. She is a member of the, uh, the Order of the British Empire uh, personally bestowed upon her by the Queen. Uh, we have uh, from Estonia the Foreign Minister Edgar Rikovic. Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, I tell you, I was more concerned in how I pronounced his last name and I got his country wrong as opposed to. Anyway, it sounds to me as if you're all way more familiar with Edgar than I am. Uh, anyway, nice to have you here, Minister. Sorry about that name thing. Uh, we have Toivo Klar, who is uh, the EU Special Representative for the Southern Caucasus and the crisis in Georgia. Uh, in 2013, he was the head of the EU monitoring mission for Georgia. Uh, he spent many years in the Estonian civil service at very senior levels. Uh, he graduated from Harvard, the J.F. Kennedy School for International Studies, and attended two years at the Arendale campus of the University of Toronto, which is really the main accomplishment of his academic life. Uh, and then Jim Townsend, I think everybody knows Jim, senior fellow at the Center of the New American Security. For eight years, he was President Obama's uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense for Europe and NATO, and he served in his time at both the Pentagon and at NATO. So. Welcome to you all. Um, I wanted to start with a very simple question and one that you may have received once or twice before. But before we start talking about how we deal with Russia, let's talk about what Russia wants. And just let me throw that out. If it's a short answer, that's fine. But Brian, let me start with you. What do you think Russia wants? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, I think what Russia wants is clear. Um, and it's also clear that Russia wants things we can't give to it. Um, Russia wants its neighbor's sovereignty to be conditional. Russia has a problem with Georgia's sovereignty, has a problem with Latvia's sovereignty, has a problem with Estonia's sovereignty, and to say, that, you know, needless to mention, it has a problem with Ukraine's sovereignty. So that's, that's something Russia wants. And anyway, I think we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to give that? I'm not. Um, Russia wants to expand the the kind of the corrupt kleptocratic system that exists inside of Russia, what the emigre political scientist Elena Lidineva calls Sistema. It wants to spread this into the former Soviet Union, into the former Warsaw Pact, and farther to points farther west. If we're okay with that, we can have a discussion with Mr. Putin. If we're not okay with that, we really can't have a discussion about this. Uh, Putin, the Russia wants to destroy NATO. It has a problem with NATO, and it wants, it wants NATO to be dissolved and destroyed. Um, and Russia wants to destroy the European Union. Russia wants the end to a rules-based international system based on institutions and wants one based on great power politics and a world where might makes right. So I think this is what Russia wants. This is clear. I mean, I think this has been clear for some time. And I think we have to stop asking what Russia wants and start thinking about what we want. So I think that's how I would, I would kind of reframe the question that way. So. Sophie, do you see it that way? Thank you very much. I think reframing the question uh, is exactly what I uh, also thought would be the right point, because I think uh, everybody understands, recognizes what Russia wants, and Georgia is a perfect example of that uh, alongside with Ukraine. 
uh, infringement of sovereignty and territorial integrity, which goes on for decades. Uh, and we find ourselves exactly in the same situation now in the 21st century, uh, where uh, razor wire fences, uh, through razor wire fences, uh, European countries are being divided. That is what we see. I think uh, the, the question that will be, will be posed later on, uh, how this should be dealt with, uh, that is more um, relevant um, for us, uh, for countries like Georgia, uh, to think how to move forward. Uh, I think that that's, uh, that's the principal question. Okay. Minister, I can't imagine another country that has more stake in this than Latvia does. Uh, how do you view, from your position, from where you sit as Minister of Foreign Affairs, when you look across that border, what do you think they want from you? Well, I think that it is going to be a very boring panel because we are going to agree... On everything. ...with everything, uh, on everything, and... Uh, no kind of discussion, so I'm quite sorry for those people who are here expecting some kind of entertainment. But um, at, at least from my perspective, I would say, first, Russia really wants to restore its status of great superpower. In order to do that, it needs Ukraine, it needs to some of those countries that uh, is in the neighborhood. Uh, from my perspective, from Latvia's perspective, I would say that we are not anymore so concerned about, uh, let's say, direct kind of uh, possible uh, influence uh, on Latvia because we are part of NATO, part of EU, and we jumped that train almost at the last moment of historic opportunity. So no military threats, thanks also to our allies, but what we see, and there is increasing attempt to influence societies from Estonia to Latvia to Germany to Spain to Italy uh, to destroy the core of society, democratic system, rule of law, and to some extent also to spread the new type of ideology. It's not anymore communism, now it's a kind of social conservative approach. Uh, they are talking about traditional values, but they are also trying to affect uh, the way how the system works through money through corruption through uh, what we call also propaganda warfare information warfare so those are three things to restore the greatness as they perceive it to let's say influence their neighbors but also i agree with my previous colleagues who spoke here uh, also to undermine uh, institutions that we are part of nato eu and also the core system of our own uh, liberal democracies Tarbo, let me go to you, but let me slightly change the question a little bit because I'm sure you probably agree with our other panelists, unless you don't, in which case jump in. Uh, but you've got a unique perspective, only not because of all the work and service that you've given to the Georgia situation and the South Caucasus, but also because you served for a long time in Estonia. So in a, in a way, you've served on both fronts, if I could put it that way. Uh, are we doing today a better job of figuring this out than we were five years ago? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I would agree with the, with the minister that uh, there's, there's not, a lot of, uh, not a lot of daylight between us here. Um, but but I, would, I would actually like to refer back to, uh, I was sitting in, in Baku on, on Monday evening with a friend in a, in a restaurant, and, and we were talking about that this topic more or less as well and 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 basically um thinking that well if if russia if if russia wants to uh, restore uh, its uh, power and influence actually what it's doing is is not really uh, very sensible um because i have i've also in my in my previous job i was dealing with central asia that actually there is such a thing as, as this Ruski Mir. And you, from Bishkek to Minsk, there is a, a common cultural um, uh, sort of emotional space uh, which the Russians could make use of as huge amounts of potential soft power, which they're not making use of. Instead, all of these countries are uh, around Russia are wary of Russia. And so the, 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 uh, what, what Russia is making use of is, it, is making use of its hard power, uh, whereas 
with much less effort, with much everybody feeling much more comfortable about it, uh, it could achieve perhaps even much more in terms of influence by by building on this soft power and having the countries around it feel actually comfortable with with this big bear sitting in Moscow. And that's uh, that's that's really a problem that that how can we how is there a way for us to to get the Russians to change track? And Jim, let me finish off this round with you. And again, you've got a very unique perspective on the Russian situation, uh, considering your background. Uh, you know, it used to be that when you thought of that struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union and then with Russia, that it was really one of arms. Uh, now, particularly in the United States and other countries too, I might add, it is more of an insidious attack uh, than anything else. When you take a look, at that relationship, particularly between the United States and Russia, uh, and put it in a five-year context, is getting worse than it was five years ago? Well, uh, yes, I, I think it is. But uh, let me start off, though, and say that we've been talking about uh, what does Russia want. And I think it's really, in a lot of ways, what does Putin want? So much of this is being driven by his own personality. I think one of the differences with the Soviet uh, Union and the Cold War, that struggle, as we know, had a lot much more of an ideological tent to it and an ideological system in Moscow that kind of ran it. And we went through a lot of definite personalities running uh, the Soviet Union. But today, it's different in the sense that we're dealing with Putin and, and, and his own views on what he wants. And number one, what he wants is to stay in power. And so he's doing whatever it takes to pump himself up among the Russian people, whether it's taking off his shirt and riding bareback on a horse or it's invading uh, Georgia and, um, and Ukraine. He's, he's, he's got this tough guy image, and that's part of what he's trying to do to make sure he stays in power and that his influence and his money and this type of thing stays there too, the oligarchical uh, system that he has set up. There's a lot there for him that he wants. And that's number one. Number two is I do feel he has this sense, almost like Adolf Hitler had, a, a sense within himself on what his mission was. His mission is to restore Russia to what it was, not necessarily even the Soviet Union, but a Russian greatness. Whatever he has in his mind of what Russian greatness looks like, he wants to restore that. Uh, and, and that manifests itself in many different ways. Uh, but one of the tools that he likes to use to bring about this Russian greatness or an image of Russian greatness or Putin's greatness is chaos. He loves chaos, and he does that through uh, means, whether it's interfering in democracy, whether it's intimidating nations, whether it's invading nations, whether it is, it is playing with them uh, on a friendly way, uh, whether it's with Trump or whether it's with, with uh, in some political parties in Europe that, that have an affinity for him, uh, whether it's Syria, whether it's Venezuela. If he, can, if he can instill chaos in this Western system that we've created, that helps him stay in power. And and uh, so for me, as I look at that question, and, 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 and as, well, as well as this way of warfare that you're talking about, too, which is much more insidious, that is another tool that he has used that is much more effective than something kinetic. Uh, you know, his misinformation campaign just in the U.S. presidential campaign that we just went through a few years ago, that is worth much more than five batteries of, of howitzers or, or tank divisions. He was able to come across the Atlantic and screw with our democracy, and we haven't been able to respond to it. So in this day and age, it's what does Putin want? And the tools that he uses to get what he wants is different than what we've seen in the past. I want to go to Brian, but just before I do, Brian, I, I just want to, as you all know, at these things, please go to Slido. Uh, let me get the questions because we're in a fairly informal environment here, and I'd like to make this as much of a conversation with all of us uh, as as we can. Brian, over to you. First, I wanted to agree with Jim that, that that Putin is effectively trying to create a situation where the side that best copes with chaos yeah. is the side that's going to be victorious. My my colleague at SEPA, Donald Jensen, just recently wrote an excellent report on this. I do want to kind of gently push back a little bit about that we just have a Putin problem. Because I don't think we just have a Putin problem. I think Putin is the current manifestation of our Russia problem. Um, because I think this conflict promises to be a very long-term conflict, unfortunately, because I believe it's systemic. 
I believe it's systemic. We're not in a kind of Cold War situation where you're having two kind of fully formed ideologies facing off against each other, but we get to have a kind of struggle between two normative systems. And we have a struggle between Western liberalism with all of its faults that we, we recognize, but we recognize as it's probably the worst system in the world except all the others, as Winston Churchill once said. Um, and on the other hand, you have, again, what I alluded to in my introductory comments, this sistema, right? What the Russian emigre political scientist Alina Ledineva calls sistema. And what is this? Well, it's this kind of it's what the Russians call panyatya and blatny sviazhi, right? The, the kind of, the, the system of understanding of informal rules of, of getting things done, of corrupt and kleptocratic networks. And this is how Russia is truly ruled. And we've allowed ourselves to be kind of fooled by the forms because Russia has been ruled this way, whether it was ruled by czars and boyers and general secretaries and politburos or so-called presidents and parliaments. It's always been ruled by sistema. Now, sistema during the Cold War was hermetically sealed. It was hermetically sealed behind the Iron Curtain. It really wasn't our problem. It was the problem of the other three, uh, the other three co-panelists, but Jim, it wasn't your and my problem. Well, guess what? After, after the end of the Cold War and the advent of globalization, you and I were probably pretty naive in thinking that our Western values were going to basically spread throughout the entire world. Um, what's happened instead is that Russia has been able to spread the values of Sistema into our systems and to corrupt and corrode and, and, and undermine our systems. That's what we're seeing right now. What Putin has done, and I think every Russian leader basically is a product of Sistema, and to a degree is shaped by Sistema and shapes Sistema to, to a little. And Putin shaped Sistema in his image to a degree. And what he's done is basically externalize it and weaponize it against the West. He's basically taken these domestic arrangements of using kind of corruption as a tool of statecraft effectively, and informal networks as a tool of statecraft, and turned it into something to undermine Western institutions. So while we have a kinetic war in the former Soviet space in an effort to re-establish re the empire in Ukraine and Georgia specifically, but it could end up in other places as well. I'd keep my eye on Belarus, and when Nazarbayev passes from the scene, I'd keep my eye on Kazakhstan, to be quite honest. But then we have a non-kinetic war against the West to undermine our institutions, and I think this is going to continue after Putin. I don't think, Putin, I think Putin is just one manifestation of that. So it's just a slight nuance in our... Brian, you le uh, led neatly to, to the, the obvious next question, which is, now that we've defined what the problem is, how are we dealing with it? And are we dealing with it today any differently than we dealt with it five years ago? And are, are we having any greater success uh, than we did five years ago to choose an arbitrary timeline? Uh, and... You know, I, I want to deal with Georgia for a second, but obviously this applies to the Baltic states as well. And uh, there are, thank you, uh, there is one person in the room who's sending a lot of questions. His name is Anonymous. Uh, I thank you. <laughs> I thank you for that. Uh, but let's deal with the question of how, of how we're dealing with it. And when you're talking about Russian soft power, not, not kinetic stuff, we know how to deal with kinetic stuff. When they shoot at us, we shoot at them, and then somebody wins and somebody loses. Uh, but the soft power is far more difficult to figure out. How is Georgia dealing with that? And Toivo, you would obviously have a say in this as well as Sophie, but, uh, and what lessons are there uh, being learned right now in Georgia and other places to deal with this soft power? Um, the more we talk uh, about uh, Russia relations with the West, uh, the more uh, we realize here that that's one of the hardest uh, questions that this panel is posing, uh, but most relevant, and we should be talking about that, particularly for countries like Georgia. Uh, uh, it, it, it's extremely important that the, the audience that we are here and more broadly the international community fully understands the challenges that we are facing, Georgia, Ukraine and any other country, uh, the country's sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity are being infringed by Russia. So here, uh, everybody here knows the context, but I just, uh, since we are comparing what, where we stand now, what was five years ago or what was ten years ago, uh, the context is there. Uh, Russia continues to violate the principles of international law. Uh, Russia continues to occupy 20% of Georgia's territories. Um, Ukraine's Crimea, annexation uh, and the situation in Eastern Ukraine, it's simply 
demonstrates the magnitude of security challenges that we are facing in the Black Sea region. I know that everybody in this room understands this. I know that, as I said broadly, more broadly, everybody understands that this should be highlighted and this should be recognized more and more, the challenges that we are facing in the Black Sea region. And conventional and unconventional threats and hybrid threats uh, that undermines uh, Western values. How we are dealing with that, it's, it's not an easy pass, um, uh, but being an immediate neighbor of Russia, uh, and facing these challenges almost on a daily basis. Um, obviously, conventional uh, threats and the occupation is there and the security challenge. But I think what makes us a uh, frontline state, uh, and here I would like to boast perhaps uh, a little bit, because Georgia uh, is a frontline state in many ways. And what makes us frontline is perhaps the values that we share and our commitment to share the values of freedom and democracy. That is our biggest instrument and tool uh, to counter uh, the threats that we are facing uh, and our commitment, perhaps, that we want to become a member of the European Union and member of NATO. And perhaps the resilience that we keep talking about it. And I, I was in um, uh, Lithuania uh, a week ago uh, at the Baltic Assembly, where uh, the minister um, uh, was also there. And we had uh, a very interesting discussion about the unity and the strengths and more strategic vision of Europe and NATO towards countries like Georgia, like Ukraine. I mean, strategic vision, uh, practicality, technical uh, assistance, it's all there. It's all very important and it's all very, uh, it, it's vital for countries like Georgia, but at the same time it's important that we've got more strategic vision. And yesterday the president of this country made very good uh, remarks uh, about, uh, about strong foreign policy. Uh, and also the remark that I remembered, and I want to reiterate here, that while we argue, and it's not about, well, it's not Georgia, we are not a member of the EU, hope, but hopefully we will be a member of EU at some point, uh, and NATO, while we argue, some, someone else takes the lead. So I think uh, that is the issue that we need to uh, talk uh, through, uh, the resilience of transatlantic security and where it lies and why this is important for countries like Georgia. It's about open door policy, it's about enlargement of the EU, and this has been always at the heart uh, of uh, transatlantic security. And our democratic values and our commitment and determination to be the front runner so that this is also an example to other countries in the region, which obviously does not play into Russia's hands. Toivo, I want to get you involved in this briefly, if I could, and then I've got a question for the minister. Yeah, I, I um, think resilience is really a key word, uh, generally speaking, and it's not only resilience, uh, Sophie was mentioning here, um, the uh, transatlantic institutions, European institutions, but it's the resilience of countries and resilience of, of, of uh, countries, uh, institutions. Uh, and, and, and here I would say that, for example, in, 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 in the Georgian case, the Russia exploited weaknesses that existed in, in Georgia, uh, made use of the, of the fact that there was uh, ethnic tension in the beginning of the 90s and and uh, jumped right in um and and so the the paradigm of course changed fundamentally in 2008 because that was when when there was a real war between russia and georgia up to now you had had russian troops in georgia but uh, but under the under the uh, heading of, of of peacekeepers but but so the 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 question again coming back is is that the, the fact that the Russians came in in the first place, that they had an, an opening to come in in the first place, was the fact that there, was, there were these conflicts. And if these conflicts had not been there, it would have been more difficult, much more difficult for the Russians to find a foothold. They might still have tried, but it would have been more difficult. And so the question is, in, in this context, what can we do, what can any country do uh, and and uh, it depends, of course, on the situation of the country, and Georgia's is a particularly difficult one with the Russian troops uh, being in South Ossetia and in Abkhazia. 
But nevertheless, what can, even in those circumstances, uh, the Georgian government do to strengthen its own situation vis-a-vis -vis the population in, in uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia in terms of reaching out to those, to those two territories to, uh, and, and, and Georgian government is doing quite a bit, but I think there's more that can be done precisely in order not to play along with the Russian playbook, but to write your own playbook. And I think that is, that is where we are, perhaps I think the mention, it was mentioned here before that, that the question is, one question is what are the Russians doing? But the question is also, what are we doing? What, is our, what are our plans? How can we strengthen our institutions, our countries in order to counteract any kind of uh, uh, initiatives? Let me just pick up on that point and I'll throw it out to anybody. And I really, there are microphones going around, but just let me, let me take my position to pose this question to you. And it was suggested, I think, by Peter. I don't know where Peter is in the room. Uh, he's a friend with Anonymous, by the way. So, uh, But you bring up the question of what we can do. And it's, it's, it begs the question then, do we have the will to do it? Do we have the will to make the sacrifices necessary to have a robust policy? And by that, I mean, when soft power is used in insidious ways, and perhaps I'm talking about oil pipelines or natural gas pipelines and this sort of thing. How, let me get your sense, and especially from a Baltic point of view, Minister, uh, how far are you prepared to go to stop this? And how much do you think that your sovereignty right now is at risk? Well, uh, I just want to come back a little bit to the previous discussion because I think it is very important. Look. We have been able to formulate some kind of basic policies back in 2014 to 2016 at two levels, EU and NATO. EU has this kind of two-way approach and five principles, meaning contain and engage, put sanctions. Uh, by the way, strange enough, but the European Union has quite coherent policy when it comes to dealing with Russia. But we are still struggling to find the, the same kind of policy to deal with China or to deal with the United States or the rest of the world. Uh, that's also very interesting. My country would always hope to have more robust, more strict policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but then I understand that in order to get whatever kind of united and more or less efficient policy, we have to compromise all the time. And that's what we did back in 2014, 2015. Not much has changed, frankly. Uh, but it's also a good news with all those, um, let's say, attacks against uh, democracies in many of EU nations, we still hold remarkably well. NATO has the same kind of policy developed from 2014 to 2016. We started with US deployments in the Baltic states uh, April 2014 when we really were scared. And if you compare five years ago the situation on the streets of Riga, Tallinn and Vilnius, People were remembering 1940, not anymore. All the opinion polls are showing that there is quite a trust in European Union, in the alliance, and people are starting kind of feel that Russia is not anymore so big threat. That's the public perception that is growing back, uh, back home. We also were able to work out a sensible strategy on resilience. What we are lacking, we are lacking resources. We are sometimes lacking understanding in all capitals in European Union. But I do believe that uh, from that point of view, we are trying to at least do uh, what is necessary and to find a common denominator. Is there a will to do more? No. Actually, there is a very mixed feeling. We have this kind of Nord Stream project developing, despite the objections of many countries, including my own. We are now struggling uh, and we are quite a minority when it comes to the restoration of the voting rights of Russia in the Council of Europe. The vote is coming in a couple of weeks. We do believe this is not the right thing because we see that there are moves from Russia that are just opposite to what we were expecting, like hospitalization of Donbas, like seizure of uh, 24 sailors of Ukraine, and then refusing to implement the ruling of the uh, international tribunal of uh, for the uh, for the law of the sea so this is a very mixed feeling however i would say that one of our major 
kind of uh, efforts right now is to keep what we have achieved at the European level. And it's not less. I would hope that we would get kind of more, um, let's say, steam, uh, more will to do more. But then we need to deal with things that we were not dealing five years ago. We have a lot of issues with the United States now, from Iran and trade to climate change and also transatlantic bond and defense spending. We have now growing debate, never have seen that before on China. And we still need to keep our Eastern partners on the um, agenda for EU foreign policy. So this is a very complex, very mixed feeling. And we are not talking about Brexit here. We are not talking about some other things that I don't want to mention because uh, then I would uh, have lecture for a couple of hours and I wouldn't stop uh, mentioning all those troubles uh, EU or, or NATO or all of us need to deal. So this is not a good thing to say that uh, uh, we are not doing enough, but I also understand the limits that we all are in. Uh, Jim, you've been sitting here listening to a lot of different topics and I want to bring you in just to respond to some of it. But And there was a question from Reinhardt, but it was also on my mind as well. And that is that we are dealing with a Russia that may be outsized in terms of its reputation and what it has done. Let's not kid ourselves. But its economy is puny compared to many other countries. Uh, it has vast natural resources, has never been able to turn itself into an economic superpower, is being constrained or should be constrained somewhat by its own economy and therefore what it, you know how it can meet its own ambitions on that front is that a significant deterrent in itself that russia just doesn't have the money to do what they want to do well you know i, I think it's a very important question and i think about that all the time and when i was in the pentagon dealing particularly after uh, the crimea invasion and trying to figure out what are we dealing with here um i kept what I kept thinking over and over again, we have to look at the facts as they are and not get lulled into this idea that, that Putin was pumping out that he's actually 10 feet tall. Uh, and uh, we can't allow ourselves to make decisions based on the wrong data and, uh, and a misunderstanding of, of what he really is uh, and what his capabilities really are. On a regional basis, he can cause a lot of problems. And I think our friends here, whether it's in Georgia or Ukraine, Latvia, Estonia, uh, having the Russians on right there on the border, uh, that's, a, that's a superpower situation right there, not even taking into consideration nuclear uh, capabilities. So, uh, so it depends on the perspective that you have in terms of what he's able to do. Uh, and so, um, so I, so, but, but I think the, m the most important thing, though, in looking at Putin and, in the right context is that while we have to keep in mind he's not 10 feet tall, they have these problems within uh, Russian society, whether it's funding, whether it's military capability. I mean, the aircraft we see flying are the old bears, and, you know, it's not like we're seeing a lot of new things. But, th but that's the point. Just because right now you're looking at Russia using these metrics like demo de demographics or GDP or this type of thing, that doesn't mean, number one, that it will always stay that way. And number two, it doesn't mean that he can't take even the little of what he has and make it into something very large. And that's what we're seeing, going back to your earlier point about his ability to use some of these new technologies to go in and have quite a big effect at a very low cost. So, um, so I, I think we fool ourselves if we look at him the way we might have 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 150 years ago as we looked at, a, at an opponent and you looked at these metrics like GDP and de demographics and say, well, they're really not that big a threat. You f lull yourself into a misunderstanding of what you're dealing with. And so we have to, on the one hand, not fool ourselves that this guy is 10 feet tall and that the Russians are behind every tree and we're going to be doing all kinds of things to defeat uh, an enemy that is not as, as big as we, we, we fear. Uh, and all the bad things that that brings to your own planning if you're doing much more than you have to do. But at the same time, don't be fooled that these weaknesses that we see, um, in fact, are not weaknesses when it comes to a regional problem like Georgia and Ukraine have come into, or the fact that they can't use technology uh, uh, such as the internet and what we've been seeing in the past, as well as new things like artificial intelligence, hypersonics, 
to achieve a capability that you would not expect from a country that you might underestimate just because of democ demographics and GDP. Okay. Um, I just need all of you to help me out here for a minute. Uh, we have a restricted time, uh, in fact, very short period of time, and I want to get this conversation going. So if you could do me a favor, and if you ask a question or want to make a point, can you do it as briefly as you possibly can? And I will apologize in advance. If you're going on a little bit too long, I'll probably intervene and ask you to wrap it up. Uh, sir, if we had a microphone, we could give. I see a couple of hands going up. And I'm also keeping an eye on Slido, so we're not ignoring that. Uh, uh, Jonathan Isle from the Royal United Services Institute in London. I wonder if I could uh, push you forward with James Townsend's point. Looking to the future, one of the areas which we see now is the sort of disintegration of most of the arms control agreements that we have, the nuclear ones, the conventional ones in Europe. So um, it's a very complex area. Just a simple question to the panel as a whole. Do you think we can engage now in a new uh, disarmament or arms control discussions with Moscow while avoiding a discussion about a division into spheres of influence? Who would like to take that? Minister. Okay. Uh, yes, we must do whatever we can to try to get a new round of the negotiations. Not only with Moscow, for instance, INF Treaty was obsolete already as the United States pulled out. We all understand that we need also China, we need anyone. Having said that, I have no illusion that we are not going to start it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But I think that at some point we need to push for some kind of new, maybe decades long, but still, uh, uh, let's say, discussion on, on arms control. And also, you remember that back in 2007, Russia was the one to pull out from the Conventional Forces Europe Agreement. That also leaves us uh, in a kind of way where probably we need to discuss this issue. We have OEC format, but uh, I have seen it for many years. It's not very efficient. It's not going to be efficient, but still I believe that uh, at least we need to try to find a way how we can engage in the new uh, round of the talks on this one. So I began my career working on SALT II. A lot of you weren't alive when SALT II was being negotiated, and I was a very young man. But I say that because uh, I'm no stranger to arms control, and I'm no stranger to its flaws and how long it takes. But I do know from Cold War days uh, all the way up through CFE and into the modern day, there is a place for arms control in the package of things that nations have to do to deter and to defend themselves. There's a role for it there. Uh, it's not, it's something that is hard to do, it takes a long time, uh, and it's a boutique point. It's, it's, there is conventional, there's nuclear, and, but there's elements of nuclear, elements of conventional that you can tackle through arms control that gives you more stability. At the end of the day, you want deterrence, you want stability, you want transparency. Transparency helps provide for deterrence. Uh, you want these things, arms control can help bring that about. It is not a silver bullet. You will never have peace if you only rely on arms control. But it's something that's part of the package, uh, and it's something that we cannot do away with. Arms control also calls for experts. You cannot do an arms control negotiation as a journalist walking in there and sitting down with the Russians and expect to get anywhere. So what we cannot do is lose the people who know how to do this, uh, myself included, not mm -hmm. just kidding. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we need to keep it. It's got to be part of it. But it, it, but it cannot be the only leg of that stool. It's got to be part of a broader package, including strong military, strong deterrence, uh, and a modern nuclear capability, but you've got to have the guidelines and the cushions that come with arms control. I'm going to go to this gentleman in a minute. I, just before I do, uh, I'm receiving a number of, of Slido questions here, which also was on my question sheet, and that is the elephant in the room, which is China. Uh, and we're talking about this emerging love affair between Putin and Xi. I, how much of that is going to affect how we deal with the Russian situation? Can we control or contain or deal with China without controlling, containing, and dealing with Russia first? Are the two connected? Sophie, do you want to deal with that? Well, um, 
I should say before answering that question that uh, the, uh, my answers to those uh, questions uh, uh, would have to bear the context from my from the perspective of my country uh, and the, in the best interest of my country. And there's a lot of Chinese investment in Tbilisi. Um, well, Georgia, <clears throat> Georgia's ambition is to uh, is to become a hub. Uh, and uh, there is a lot that we are doing. Uh, obviously, uh, we have a very strong and straightforward and clear foreign policy, uh, and this is clear, clearly European integration and NATO integration, uh, and this is not just a declared goal. We are consistently uh, delivering uh, to get closer to these institutions, and that's a fact. Uh, Cooperation with China uh, and our relations with China, again, uh, the, given the context of my country, we are diversifying uh, our markets. Uh, we are turning Georgia into a hub. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we do have uh, the, the relations with China. Uh, that, that, that is, uh, uh, but that's being balanced. Uh, and in the best interest, um, and in the best in interest of our country. Brian? First of all, I wouldn't characterize it as, as a love affair. I'd characterize it more as a shotgun wedding that's quickly turning into a dysfunctional marriage. Um, I mean, it, it, let, let's face facts. I mean, Moscow's pivot to China came as a result of the falling out of its relations with the West. And in that relationship, Moscow is clearly the junior partner to China, although they are very loath to admit it. But China's viewing Russia as a source of cheap raw materials. And this is beginning, coming back to haunt Moscow now. With your, we're seeing protests in the Baikal region over Chinese investment there. There was even a, 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 a web page encouraging locals to throw garbage into Lake Baikal because there were conspiracy theories that the Chinese were going to steal all of Russia's water. So the policy of the Kremlin is increasingly at odds with the populations of the Far East in Russia, there's a reason that no Sino-Russian relationship have, has ever lasted. And that is because neither one of those two countries wants to be a junior partner. In this case, Russia's clearly the junior partner. I don't, I don't see this as a long-term uh, as, as a long-term marriage. It's, it's a dysfunctional marriage that's gonna sooner or later coming to an end. I think Moscow's hope is that at some point the West is going to sue for peace with Moscow in the, in the interest of, of, of confronting China. I think that's what they're hoping for, and that's what they're gambling on, but I don't think it's going to happen. Thanks, Brian. Uh, can you bring a microphone to this gentleman? Yeah. Oh, you've got a microphone. Thank Go you. Ahead. I'm Alexander Titorjuk. I'm from East European Security Research Initiative Foundation from Ukraine, Kyiv. And I have one question about some point I, I, I think you missed here in this discussion. This is a Russian civil society. How we should influence these, these entities? Because without having support from civil society, from, I mean, whole Russian society, uh, it will be impossible just to execute any kind of policy towards Ukraine, towards you know, Georgia, towards Crimea, and, and all other things. Do you have any kind of ideas how to influence Russian society to make the changes, then to push some kind of pressure on the ruling elites to destroy this system, so called? Thank you. Amber do you want to? Well, I, I would, I would uh, first of all, civil society is indeed very important. Uh, I think. From, from an EU perspective, actually, the European Union has been trying and is continuing to try to engage with Russian civil society and to, and to, to work with Russian civil society. To what extent it is, it, it has become also more, more difficult to engage with Russian civil society uh, because of, of greater restrictions. But, uh, but, I mean, but in general, I agree with you. I think, I think uh, it is important uh, to strengthen civil society, whatever uh, whatever we can do, uh, that that ultimately, again, I think the ultimate hope and goal for any neighbor of Russia is that that Russia, at one point, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but at one point, turns around and and becomes a big country, but a country that its neighbors actually feel reasonably comfortable to live with, and I think that's there, civil society will be extremely important. No, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, we've seen during the Soviet Union days uh, the importance of civil society, and it wasn't 
very, very evident during those days in Moscow where those folks were. They were underground and this type of thing. But, but now there, there's still some uh, civil society that we can work with. But you're right, it's, they're getting much more, uh, much smaller, they're harder to find and under a lot of pressure because Putin knows that too. And it goes back to this point about Putin. He's not going to sit there and allow the United States, for example, uh, for us to go in and to create this opposition to him. And he, he's, he's already been battling that. We all, we all know that. So how can we figure out a way to support civil society, uh, to support all the things that civil, civil society can do in Moscow without causing a blowback uh, and, and wrecking uh, what's left there? Uh, and that's a... That's a um, that's a hard task for an open society to do. There's a lot of things you can do quietly behind the scenes, uh, but, uh, but, but, but that, when that's discovered and found out, can cause massive problems. So uh, your question is a very good one, is a very important one, and I just don't think there's any really good answers except to continue to be persistent and try, 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 try. You want to say something, Brian? I think we have to come, like, kind of come to terms with the fact that our ability to affect events inside of Russia is extremely limited, and that the West engaging with civil society, as laudable as that is, puts that civil society in danger. And I think the, the, the business of changing Russia is up to the Russians and up to Russian civil society. I would disagree with you that we can't help Ukraine without engaging Russian civil society. I think Ukraine is an area where we certainly can have an, have an impact. And I think we should be focusing our efforts on the countries like Ukraine and Georgia, and to a lesser degree Moldova, that have chosen to, to, to go west, to break free of this sistema. And I think we, th this is where we should be placing our efforts. And I'm, I'm more of the mind that we need to contain <laughs> Russia right now and leave the business of changing Russia up to the Russians. Mark Galliotti, I don't know where you are, Mark. Right there. You're right there. <laughs> Let me read your question and then ask you, can the West do anything positively to make Russian policy less hostile, or is our only option to deter and outlast? Can you give me 30 seconds more on that? Well, I can. <laughs> oh, are you Mark? I am. Oh, I, I don't know why I thought he looks just like you. Okay. Sure. Thanks very much, Mark Galliotti. Also, Rusing. Um, yeah, I mean, just just to sort of, in a way, riff off this 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 last point. Um, I mean, the, the question is, civil society is only one part of that overall equation. Do we just simply accept that Russia is going through its own um, post-imperial uh, crisis? Uh, I say this as coming from Brexit land. Um, and therefore, we just have to just make sure it can we minimize the damage it can do to the rest of us. Or is there anything we can do positively to address it? Because the thing that strikes me is when I'm in Moscow, time and time again, I talk to people within the system, and as far as they're concerned, they are at war with the West, and the West started it. Now, that's wrong, but nonetheless, it is genuinely believed. Do we just have to live with that, or can we do anything about it? Sure. Briefly, and then maybe yeah. to Sophie. Yeah. Thanks for setting up what I've been wanting to say to the entire panel. I mean, I think we do have to, I, I, I would say that we can only contain the damage right now, basically. I don't, I don't think there's anything we do to, to, to positively change Russia's behavior. And I think we have to come up with a kind of 21st century policy of containment, for lack of a better word. I mean, I call it hybrid containment because it's not your grandfather's containment. It's not putting some tanks in the fold of gap. It starts with resilience. The minister was talking about it, and I would concur that Latvia has done a great job along with the other Baltic states in, in, in constructing kind of resilient societies, and I think this is something we can all learn from. Um, there's a direct correlation between levels of corruption and, the le and, and, and levels of resilience vis-a-vis -vis Russia's, uh, Rus Russia's active measures, and I think countries that have done a great job on corruption like Estonia, like Latvia, and like Georgia, have fu have been much more resilient yeah. against against Russian active measures. So, kind of the battle begins at home, but you also have to be able to deter Russia. There has to be an or, or else, right? There has to be an or else. And I've, I mean, my colleague Edward Lucas has proposed snap financial exercises, where we basically kind of run through financial exercises of what assets we'd freeze and when, when what, what, uh, what bank accounts we'd seize in the event of, of, of Russian aggression, hybrid, kinetic, non-kinetic, or otherwise against, against our allies. So I think we have to start thinking in these terms. Um, I think we have to start thinking in terms of early warning systems. 
We have early warning systems for nuclear weapons and for terrorism. We need kind of early warning systems for weaponized corruption. So I think we have to start thinking through what containing something like this means in the 21st century. And uh, Jim, I want to go to you, but you know, an interesting part of what you're saying though, and this applies to the Baltic states in particular, where the electrical grid is still controlled by Russia and how easily it would be for them to cause mischief back if we caused mischief going forward. And Minister, I want to get your reaction to that, and then Jim, I want to go to you. Well, I, I, and I don't want to get political here in terms of U.S. politics, talking about Brexit land. We've got, a, we've got our own land back in the U.S. Uh, but, I, but I think there's, there's, in going to your question about what can, what can we do, uh, there's a player we really haven't talked much about, uh, and I think we have to, and that is I, th I think one of the things that we can do belongs squarely on the lap of the United States, and we've got to have a clearer policy about dealing with Russia. It's, it's a bit muddled. Uh, you've got uh, the Pentagon studies and the NSC studies and the, super, the, the competition between the U.S. and Russia, but there is a leadership part that the United States has, is, is weak on right now in terms of helping to uh, propel unity within NATO or within, within Europe as we try to deal with the various aspects of Russia. We're not as strong as we have been in the past in terms of a, a solid, agreed upon uh, uh, strategy and policy and leadership dealing with Russia. We need to return to that, and that's one of the things that we can do, is to try to have a stronger policy dealing with Russia and to lead. Minister, briefly on the grid. Well, uh, still coming back also to the civil society, let's not forget that Russia's civil society is also very different. And when we speak about Russia's civil society, for instance, the view on Crimea would be totally different uh, depending on whom you speak. So if you speak about Ukraine and assistance to Ukraine, don't assume that everyone in the Russia's uh, opposition or civil society would say that we should return Crimea to, to Ukraine in two weeks' time. We take, take over. Or second, uh, on this kind of uh, engagement with civil society, uh, I would say two things, and I very much agree with those who are saying that uh, the system can change itself only with, from within, like in all good days of the Soviet Union. But if we meet with representatives of civil society, if we show that they are important to us, that we want to speak with them, uh, that actually also gives some moral boost to them and also to work with them. But let's not uh, go into financing them, because in that case you will find that uh, there will be accusations of taking foreign money, spying and, and being the agent of influence. An electrical grid and the energy. Look, I think that if you look at the Baltic states, we have done remarkable work already to uh, unbundle from the gas uh, supplies. So we are now able to get more uh, gas supplies from not only Russia, but from different parts of the world. We have LNGs, we have interconnectors uh, building. And now the second issue that uh, we are now working with the European Union, and I hope that by 2025 or so, we'll be able also to connect with the European Union power grid and to, uh, let's say, say goodbye to, to, to Russia and Belarus. But then, again, I was myself part of Latvian delegation back in 2010 visiting Moscow with then president. And one thing that Russian leadership said back then, and it hasn't changed, if you pay your bills, you will get electricity and gas. And by the way, with all our bad political relations, economic part, and while you are paying bills, that part has always worked with Russia. So it's always about money at the end of the day. Can I just, and I, I apologize, I know that there's other people who want to ask questions, and, and we are uh, mere moments away from uh, coming to an end on here, but I, I did want to bring up a question that I think might be on a lot of people's minds, especially those who don't come from the United States, uh, which is basically all of us except for Jim, <laughs> Jim and Brian. Uh, Jim, you brought it up, and the question is that in, uh, in foreign policy, especially dealing with Europe and, and, and now dealing with Russia, the U.S. is giving us a confused picture. The U.S. is being belligerent to their, to their trade allies, let alone to their military allies. And I'm wondering, and I take this because the president, the outgoing president of Slovakia said this yesterday in his speech, and that is that it is time for a more European response to this as opposed to 
And I think, and I don't want to put words in his mouth or, or even thoughts that may not have been there, but it does beg the question, should the rest of the world, particularly Europe and its extensions, develop a new type of leadership for dealing with this, or should we double down on a highly unpredictable U.S. administration? Where do you go? It would be a disaster if Europe developed its own way to go as a hedge against the United States uh, because of the events over the past couple of years. The number one thing we need is unity, transatlantic unity, as hard as that is. And it's been hard in the past, too. This isn't something new. We, the transatlantic unity has had its ups and downs since 1945. This, is, this isn't new. I, I would say that there's new elements and there is a, a louder megaphone from the White House saying things you're, you're not used to hearing. Uh, but, uh, but, but, and I will also say, too, there is a need for Europe, a strong Europe, a strong European Union, a strong European defense industry. There is a need for a strong uh, European sense of self, too, but not, not, op not, not in opposition or in counterbalance to the United States or, or as a result of, of politics in the United States, which is transient like all politics are. Um, so I think as terms of what the European Union is doing, what uh, some European capitals are talking about in terms of a European identity, I mean, CS ab above and beyond CSDP, a strong Europe is helpful to the transatlantic relationship. We, we don't want that, but what we don't want is two separate entities going about dealing with adversaries uh, or competitors in two separate ways. We've got to have unity. That's got to be the case. We're going through a rough patch now. We will see where politics go, but for, for gosh sakes, what we don't want to do is, is make decisions in Europe based on politics in the United States that is transitory. And the same thing in Europe, too. Politi politics in Europe are transitory, and we don't want to do things in the United States uh, based on that. So we've got to stay unified. That's the key. The context to the question from a Canadian perspective was that until a week ago, we had tariffs slapped on steel and aluminum because on a 232 we posed a threat to the national security of the united states canada we don't even pose a threat to ourselves let alone to the united <laughs> states uh but uh toivo and sophie i know everybody want to get in on this so we'll do this the final round no i, I just echo what he said uh what, what jim said and, and the fact that that in, in today's world, neither the United States nor Europe can, in the end, just do it alone because uh, we have a huge and rising China. We, w it's a question of, of who is going to set the rules of the world that we live in. And, and if, if, we, if we have this rift that we, and this, these disagreements that we have between the US and Europe right now, uh, if, if that deepens, if we, if we drift apart, then we are only serving others. Neither of us is going to win from that. And so in the end, it's a question of just sticking it out and, and, and counting on, on getting back together again uh, because, because this is the only way we can ensure that those values that we share actually across the Atlantic, that, these, that we can push these values forward also in, in the future. Um, yeah, um, because um, I, I, that was the point that I wanted to make uh, as, as the panel is almost over. Um, it's the power of unity, and that's how I started my remarks, uh, and it's the resilience. Uh, but there are certain caveats uh, of building resilience, uh, and I want to go back to the point that I made earlier, that um, transatlantic unity and resilience lies in open door policy and enlargement of the European Union and NATO. And this has been always at the heart of Euro-Atlantic security. And this is from the perspective of Georgia, from countries like Georgia, which are, again, maybe I'm repeating myself, but I think that's a vitally important point that I'm making, that particularly for countries like Georgia who have chosen the past and are determined to continue this past, it's extremely important that these messages, this unity is maintained, and this is an encouragement for us, for us, for Ukrainians, uh, to have the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Just before I go to the minister, because I, uh, and, and, and Brian should, just picking up on Sophie's point, has the time come for us just to 
bring Georgia into NATO? Yes. Anybody disagree with that? Yesterday. Okay. <laughs> Minister, over to you. Well, indeed, it was time to bring Georgia to NATO in 2008, and we didn't do that in Bucharest, and we got uh, the August of 2008, but um, that's, that's the history, and we still think that uh, it's a high time to, to keep our promise. However, this panel sounds like the ordinary uh, European Union Foreign Affairs Council or NATO Foreign Ministerial. We always talk about unity and solidarity. And we agree always that we need unity and solidarity. And by the way, things are actually much better on the ground than they are in the virtual reality. If you look at, let's say, NATO, I would say that I'm very happy to see that all the decisions of Warsaw Summit of 2016 have been implemented and also the decisions at very famous Brussels summit where the press got it wrong and actually the reality was totally different in the closed room. Uh, we see that uh, this is a very mixed picture and I'm not going to be very original. We are living in a very strange world where we sometimes get uh, something happening in those small gadgets and we comment as diplomats on tweets and, and Facebook posts and then when we speak about uh, real things, then things again are a bit, bit better. But from my perspective, I just want to leave with three short points. First of all, for us, for the small European countries, it is very, very important not to be put in the position where we are asked the question, are we better Europeans or are we better transatlanticists? Because we all understand that the US role in Europe's security is the same like it was 30, 40, or 10 years ago or five years ago. It's very important. Second, uh, I do believe that sometimes we are lacking a dialogue between Europe and uh, the United States. For instance, when we are talking about uh, new ideas on the common security and defense policy, it's not that they are kind of contradictory to NATO, but when Europe is ready to spend more money as Europe on mobility or, or infrastructure that is also used for, for defense, then I think it's the right thing to do. And sometimes our American friends are looking at with some suspicion that we are creating something that is parallel or contradictory. No, it's actually complementary. Uh, even the biggest skeptics of the United States in Europe are understanding that uh, United States and NATO is important. And final point, where I believe Europe is getting it wrong, this is defense spending. And this is where I would agree with all the American administrations I remember from President Clinton, President Bush, Obama, and now President Trump, all of them are asking and begging European allies to spend at least 2%. And only six or seven countries by the last count of NATO are doing that out of 30, almost 30 members of the alliance. So this is a very mixed feeling. So to, to make a blame game that uh, the current administration is worse than the previous in the United States or Europe is fragmented, it's not the case. But we have our problems to solve and many problems to solve. Thank you, Minister. And, and just unless there's any confusion at all, Edgar is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. I know somebody <laughs> thought... And by the way, thank you for, <laughs> for mixing up me with Estonia. Normally I get mixed up with Lithuania. So <laughs> this was something novel. Brian, I'll give the last word to you. I'm not going to say anything terribly original here. I want to kind of give a ringing endorsement to Jim's uh, passionate call for transatlanticism. Going back to the question you began this panel with, if we go down that path of, of splitting the transatlantic alliance, we're giving Putin one of those main things that he wants. It's a big gift to Putin, and we can't do that. But beyond that, I mean, the, like the Canadian-American relationship, and I say that as a proud American of Canadian descent and a oh, proud okay. North American, okay. um, this relationship is deeper than yep. any one U.S. president, and the transatlantic relationship is deeper than any one U.S. president. So I think we, we've been through rough patches before. We'll get through this rough patch, um, and we, I think they basically keep calm and carry on, as, as uh, Mark would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I, that brings us to the end. So Jim Toivu, Edgar, Sophie, and Brian, thank you all very much, and thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you.